Today we continue in our refining series. Our word for 2024 is refine, and our statement is this. In 2024, we will submit ourselves to God's refining process. We, as individuals and a church body, will not only allow ourselves to be refined by God, we will be thankful for the process, knowing it lets us be refined for God. We're going to continue our exploration. We began with the Pharisees and how understanding their actions can reveal much to us about the religious spirit that works even today. We're going to return to our grounding passage for this subplot series on the Pharisees. We are in Matthew chapter 23, and we're going to start at verse 33. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation." We're going to zero in today on verse 33 and particularly the phrase brood of vipers. That word brood doesn't just mean a group of snakes. It is the word progeny and it's used in terms like offspring, child, or fruit. I want you to keep that in your mind. This is actually the third instance in Matthew where we see that phrase brood of vipers. Let's turn to the first occurrence in Matthew 33. Starting at verse 1 and 2. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Down to verse 5. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. John the Baptist draws a crowd of all types of people out to the wilderness where he was preaching. I'm probably going to talk in depth about John maybe next week. But for now, I want you to know a little bit about him. He was a prophet. He spoke God's word to a people for a specific time. He could speak on things that were happening in their lives at the moment, which we're going to see. And he also spoke on the things to come. John was the forerunner to Jesus, the one chosen by God to get the people ready to accept the gift of salvation Jesus would provide. You can't say that John is preaching a gospel message because the gospel was not there yet. Jesus had not given his life yet. He had not been resurrected yet. Instead, he was preaching a message of repentance. He was getting the people ready. And the first step in getting them ready is to realize there was a need to repent. There was a need to be different than they had been. There was a need to make things right with God. John is also important because he broke 400 years of prophetic silence. The Jewish people had prophets throughout their history telling them a Messiah was coming. A Savior who would rescue them was on the way. But then after Malachi, they don't get words from the Lord in this way for 400 years. Suddenly, the people of Jerusalem and all around the area start hearing about this crazy man out in the wilderness talking too wild to be something uh, like everybody else and declaring that the Messiah was coming and that they had to get ready. And it drew a crowd. Matthew 3 and 7 says, But when he, John, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? In our study of the Pharisees, this is an important passage because it's our introduction in the Gospels to this group. And what an introduction it is. I think it's interesting that the Bible makes no effort to make us think positively about the Pharisees. There is no effort to say, well, they were decent people. They were trying to uphold the law, but there's none of that. This is the first thing we hear is the prophet calling them a brood of snakes. We know from the account of this interaction in the book of John that the Pharisees had come to discredit his right to baptize. That's found in John 1 and 25. And that verse starts with a word that means they were interrogating John. And he knew it, so he calls them out. He questions who told them to come to the wilderness because he knew they were not coming there in response to a repentance message. The Pharisees would not have come to repent because they didn't think they had anything to repent of. And we see this today. We see people today 
who are convinced they have nothing to repent of. They have nothing to be sorry for. They have not missed the mark in any way whatsoever. I've been at this however many years. They want to give you their resume. They want to tell you how long they've been holding up the church. And that's the attitude that actually holds up the church. And they're so convinced they don't need God. They don't need the altar. They don't need to be searched by him. They don't need the Holy Spirit to convict them because they've done nothing wrong. Oh, I wish I could say they learned their lesson that day, but they didn't. In Matthew 3, 8, he says, Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do you remember that definition of the word brood? Remember I told you the word progeny? And that it could mean several things. It can mean offspring and child and fruit. John says, you are the offspring or fruit of the serpent. Now that's true in the natural, that they came from a long line of wickedness. But it's also true in the spiritual. Their actions were related to the devil himself. Remember in the garden, when the devil comes as a serpent and he offers fruit, and the Bible says that Eve took the fruit because it looked good for eating. The Pharisees were the fruit of the devil, the offspring of the original serpent, and on the outside, they looked good. They wore good clothes. They had money. They followed the rituals. Outwardly, they claimed to be the protectors of God's word. They would even say, quote, they were setting a fence around the law because they wanted to protect it. It sounds like a righteous goal. It sounds like a good goal. It sounds like something God may have called them to do. However, it's the same lie we see in the old Catholic church when they used to say that they were chaining up the Bible because only the priest should get to look in the Bible because it's so holy and so sacred. We don't want anybody messing it up. And the truth of the matter was there would have been freedom for those people if they had been able to read the Word of God, if they had been able to read it in their language, if they had been able to access it, because then they would have known that the things that were happening in the church were violating Scripture. And it's the same way with the Pharisees. They were themselves violating and going against the heart of God. The Pharisees, like Eve, accepted good-looking fruit. They accepted the trap of thinking they were superior. They accepted the sin of pride. And when they accepted that fruit or progeny of Satan, they became the fruit or progeny of Satan. And then they passed that fruit of Satan on in the form of hatred, malice, bitterness, and persecution. When we accept the fruit of Satan, we become the fruit of Satan. We accept what he's offering us. We have now partnered with him and just expect that now you are going to be like him. Matthew 3, 9. He goes on, Do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Apparently, the Pharisees have been perpetuating a popular myth that said that whoever came from Abraham had eternal security. That's an important concept even today. It's the same concept the people who bought up all those tolerance bumper stickers a few years ago, they bought the same idea. They'll tell you, well, Jews and Christians and Muslims, we all come from Abraham and therefore we're all the same. Listen, the God we worship, the spirit we feel, the Jesus who is the only way to the Father has always been and will always be. We don't just trace back to Abraham. We go back to the one true living God who created it all, the God who made Abraham. That's where we look. So to get your security from a man created by God instead of from God himself makes no sense whatsoever. Jesus has a whole discourse on this claim of security through Abraham, and it's recorded in John 8. And where he lands is that if you were Abraham's children, you would act like Abraham. But instead, you're the devil's children because you act like the devil. Oh, John tells the Pharisees, you think your lineage is so special and makes you elect. But God can take the pebbles on this riverbank that have no life in them whatsoever and make them Abraham's children. 
In other words, you're not that special. And if you don't do right, he can go another direction. A lot of us have heard that passage that says that the rocks would cry out in our place if we wouldn't properly praise. A lot of us have heard that. But he's saying that God can literally take those rocks and make them part of the family. Now that's an even deeper notion. And here's how it applies here. There are people who are all about a pedigree. I feel sorry for people that want me to be impressed by it. I've met people before, and that's their first introduction to me. They tell me their name, and then they tell me who they're related to, and I'm supposed to be impressed by it. Sometimes I don't even know who they're talking about. Sometimes I do, but either way, it doesn't make a difference about who's standing right in front of me. There are people that they think it matters so much that they should have a higher status because of where they came from. It doesn't matter if your family is first generation of the church or you are generation zero in the church. There should be no differentiation among the redeemed. If I had to do it, I could give you my spiritual pedigree too, but I don't do that because I'm not a dog. Therefore, my pedigree does not matter. Instead, I was a spiritual orphan. I have been adopted and grafted into the family of God. And if you have asked the Lord to forgive you of your sins, then you and I are no different. If your entire family from the very beginning, you really could trace it all the way back. And oh, what a wonderful legacy you have and be thankful for that. But don't think it means that you are secure. Don't think that it's that the blood of Jesus just piles up with each different generation. And so you got this extra measure at the end of it. That's not the way that it works. And so he says to them, He could take these dead rocks and make them as special as you think you are. I wish the people who are hung up on their pedigree would realize what he's saying. Because we serve a God of resurrection. And how that applies today, it looks like this. If we just hang our hat on security because of our family and because we feel special... Do you know what God can do? He can go out there and he can find some people who are spiritually dead. He can call them back to life again. They can become the foundation of the church, a new foundation in the church. They will become the people who will work and serve faithfully because they're not so far removed that they have forgotten that it is Jesus who brought them back to life and they can evangelize an entire community. If we don't do right with all of our pedigree and all of our importance and all of our lineage, then he will go and call someone who is dead to life and they'll do it. These people who fall in line with the Pharisees and are more focused on pedigree than progeny, more consumed with genes than grace, and more focused on their history than his story, Mm. they're going to miss it. They're going to miss Jesus. The Pharisees miss Jesus. He was on his way. He was on his way to the place where they were, but they were so hung up on their special history. Matthew 3.10, John said, Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. He goes on to make it clear that he's talking about the fire of hell that their Ancestry.com cannot save them from. And spoiler If you go forward, you'll know that the Pharisees don't listen because Luke 7.30 says they never got baptized. Immediately after this altercation, Jesus arrives and he is baptized. And that's the start of his public ministry. Day one of a three-year public ministry was launched with this warning from the prophet. Quickly, we're going to move forward two years to Matthew 12. Here, Jesus has just delivered and healed a man, and he knows the accusing thoughts of the Pharisees. The Bible literally says he knew their thoughts, and he responds verbally to what they were thinking. 
He gives them a rebuke. Let's focus at verse 33 of Matthew 12. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers. Here we go again. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart will bring forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. Remember what I told you. Jesus knew their thoughts, according to verse 25, and now here he is condemning them for their words. Remember, Jesus had said, if you do something in your heart, it's the same as doing it in real life. We've got to learn to check not only our mouths, but also our hearts. Because you can only check your mouth so long before everything in your heart spills out. We can be really proud of ourselves for stopping ourselves before we said something. We brag about it, don't we? And we say, oh, I'm, I'm not even going to say what I'm thinking. And we think it's so cute and it's so clever. It's not cute. It's not clever. It's sin. It's sin according to Jesus. And that's why David prayed in Psalm 19, 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock or my strength and my redeemer. Because eventually your meditations become your motivations and your thoughts become your actions. See, David meditated on a woman he saw. What could have just been a passing glance and moved on when he was in the place he shouldn't have been to start with, he kept looking at her and thinking on her. And the looking and the thinking and the meditating, it boiled over into find out who that woman is. And he brings her to the palace. She becomes pregnant. In the end of the story, he's had her husband murdered and the baby dies too. Because what he meditated on became the motivation for wickedness. And we are no better than David. We are no different than David. The thing we meditate on, it will motivate us. It will push us to the next thing. And so Jesus was trying to warn them about the importance of what was coming out of their heart, up through their throat and out their mouth. We live in a culture and under agendas that try to strip words of their power. A big reason the pornographic industry in America has been allowed to flourish, you can trace back to Supreme Court hearings. And then one of them, uh, astonishingly, someone who's supposed to be one of the smartest people in America, on the Supreme Court, said that they couldn't, they couldn't really legislate pornography because they couldn't define what pornography was. In the 90s, we had a president who became famous that he said you couldn't have real definitions. It depends on what your definition of the word of this action was, if I committed that action or not. Now. We're in a culture where we can't figure out what the word woman means. It's a tactic of the enemy to strip words of their power. But Jesus said words matter because it's a gauge on your heart. Even seemingly good phrases like actions speak louder than words, that's problematic too. Is that true? Yeah, that can be true, that your actions speak louder than words. Of course. But oftentimes it's used as a license for people to say whatever hateful, hurtful, harmful thing they want to. And then they think their actions smooth it over. But the problem is speaking words is an action. That's an action too. When you are ugly talking about somebody, when you slander somebody, when you are trying to murder them with your mouth and you commit character assassination those are actions. They came out of your heart and God will judge you for them. 
words matter. So here we are in the middle of his ministry, and he's echoing the words of the prophet John. Both called them vipers, both called them to bear good fruit, both warned them of judgment to come. Now let's fast forward to what we called our grounding passage for this series, Matthew 23 and 33. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Verse 36, assuredly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. This discourse ends, and in chapter 26, we see the beginning of Jesus' final days. Instead of heeding the warnings, 26 opens with them plotting to kill Jesus. When I presented this message to my church, I had a comparison chart where you can look at these, these chapters, Matthew 3, Matthew 12, and Matthew 23. And you're going to see some similarities across the board. You see that phrase, brood of vipers, used in all three. You see in all three this concentration on judgment that is coming. You see at different points this talk about fruit and what they're bearing in their lives. You can lay them out as parallels with one another, mainly this last passage with the first. There's a progression John told them they must begin to bear fruit. Matthew 12, Jesus warned them again about the fruit, but by Matthew 23, the time to warn was over. People will talk about how could a loving God send people to hell? Well, the truth is he doesn't. Our actions do it. But there's another side to the coin. If God is as harsh and vengeful as they claim, why did he give the Pharisees three years to do the right thing? The focus on Pharisees may seem an odd one in a refining series, but in this refining series, we keep coming back to these terms of holiness and sanctification that we must be set apart. Well, the word Pharisees comes from a word meaning the separated ones. We've talked about the benefit of refining, but this is the risk of refining. If we aren't careful, we become like the Pharisees, convinced we are safe convinced we have nothing to repent of. See, those Pharisees had not been confronted in their actions until they showed up at the place God was moving in the wilderness. They didn't heed the warning, but they were confronted with it. And if maybe they had taken the time to listen, they would have been able to experience those moments when Jesus comes out And the Holy Spirit descends like a dove and the voice of the Father is heard. But instead they were convinced they had done nothing wrong. They would not even entertain the concept that they needed to repent. And we can't say we're better. We can't say that we haven't had moments of pride like that where we think because of our family history or because of how long we've sat in a pew or because of how high we have made it in the church, that we don't need to even have that conversation. But what if, like the Pharisees, it's the point of we've got to get to the place where God is moving before it's confronted. Sometimes those things, they really are deep down. Sometimes the things we need to repent of, truly, we don't know it. It's not just being stiff-necked and we won't listen. It's that we really don't know because it was so terrible. We shoved it down because it was too hard to deal with. And to get through the day, we pretended it wasn't there. But let me tell you something. When you get into the presence of Almighty God and the light that surrounds Him, every ounce of darkness will be exposed. The Pharisees missed Jesus. I don't want to miss Jesus because I was so prideful. I would not get into God's presence and ask him to search me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for each one who's listening right now. Lord, I pray that any pride in us, Lord, would be demolished. And that we would be willing to stand before you and have you search us, God. To make sure that there is nothing in us that should not be there. Lord, let us not be like the Pharisees who miss Jesus because they were too focused on themselves. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to bear good fruit. 
Help us, Lord, to live lives of pleasing sacrifice unto you. And guide us, Lord, in all ways so that we could say that we are honoring and glorifying you and that your church is edified in that process. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to thank you again for joining me, Pastor Lindsay Schreiber, coming to you from the Spring Street Church of God of Prophecy at 1001 West Spring Street. We have Bible study, youth service, and children's church on Wednesday nights at 630 and at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. We have worship and the word each week. If you live close and don't have a church to attend, I hope you're there. If not, I hope you'll join us on YouTube so you can be a part of our online family. Have a great week.